Today we shall look into an area which has emerged because of the success of embedded systems. In fact, uh, this is the last lecture in the series of talks on embedded systems. So what I decided, I decided to look into an area which is emerging, which is based upon the various principles and architectural aspects that we had studied about embedded systems. In this lecture, we shall not possibly answer many questions because uh, the field itself would require uh, a study in depth. We shall possibly encounter the questions and can understand where we can go with embedded system technology. So today we shall talk about briefly pervasive and ubiquitous computing. The basic idea is that computing is embedded everywhere in the environment. Okay? So when you are talking about computer being embedded into appliances, therefore in a way computer now can be embedded everywhere. It can be embedded onto your chair, it can be embedded onto your table, it can be embedded onto the walls of your house. Okay? So computing is embedded everywhere in the environment and that is possible given the current state of the art of the embedded technology. So information access and communication is possible virtually everywhere and devices can be connected and networked. We are not talking about connecting or networking just computers. We are talking about connecting devices, connecting appliances. Even standard household devices themselves can be connected over a network. And that is the bigger picture of embedded systems. And that leads us to what is what I am referring to here as ubiquitous and pervasive computing. What does ubiquitous mean? Existing or being everywhere at the same time, constantly encountered, widespread. Another way, omnipresent, all over, universal and constantly available. So that means whenever I am in a room, in this room itself, if I want to have or uh, have a look at my email, it may be possible the computer senses that I am here, it figures out where is my email server and presents the email on my screen. Okay? So the omnipresence of, the, of yourself along with the computers, along with the communication is what is ubiquitous. Even the computers can be part of your dress itself. You may wear a shirt which has caught the sensors as well as a processing element as well as a communication element which may monitor your body temperature and accordingly automatically adjust the temperature in the environment. Okay? So it is present, being present everywhere. So the whole idea is that, that embedded systems should be pervasive to the point of subconscious. In fact, there is a statement which says that technology is really successful when the technology can make itself disappear. Okay? So if you are wearing a shirt and you are not conscious that it is actually having a set of sensors, computers and communication elements, the technology itself has disappeared and it has pervaded your being or existence. And that is the basic philosophy or the picture that is being looked at. How do you achieve ubiquity? So basic technology wise make computing mobile and connected. In fact, all the devices that we have talked about, majority of them are mobile devices in some sense or other and if they have the networking capability, they can be connected. Say for example, this can be a, a coffee making machine or a tea making machine, which can have a computer sitting inside, which can be connected, which can even have a camera or may not have a camera. You come in and type in your code, it can prepare coffee with the correct mix, correct amount of sugar that you would like to put in it, at the same time can read out your emails. Okay? So in the morning when you come to your office and want to have the first cup of coffee, you go to that coffee making machine and it provides everything that you like to start your day. That is the philosophy and the picture that you are looking at. So what do you say 
that making computing mobile and connected and, uh, and at the same time instrument the person and instrument the physical surroundings. So if I instrument myself then I am connected my various parameters are connected and I get information over that. At the same time I can instrument the whole surroundings. In fact this is an example where standard household items like say glass of water, your uh, a vase, everything has been associated with a sensor okay? and it is also associated with the communication link and in fact uh, your environment itself in that case provides an interface to work with the world. Okay? So in a sense you can think that if there are two persons talking to each other in this sensed environment, you can create a complete image of that environment okay, on the screen, communicate it to a third person who is remotely located okay. and what you can do is you can actually have a feeling that the third person is also there in the meeting with you. You can have something like a virtual remote presence of a person. In fact, your environment completely has been instrumented and since the environment itself is instrumented, interacting with a pervasive computing system boils down to interacting with the environment. How can you instrument a person? You can put various gadgets onto him. It is not, so what you get is in many cases known as wearable computing. You are not seeking for computer, computer is with you, that is the basic idea. So ubiquity can be achieved by making computing mobile and connected. In fact, today in a way we have reached that level in the sense that all of us almost carry a mobile phone or a PDA or a communicator which is actually has got connectivity as well as computing. And then if you can make interesting appliances built with similar kind of a capability, then your entire environment becomes sensitive to your needs and sensitive to the needs of the world around you. And that is that's the basic concept and the motivation for going into ubiquity. And in fact, there is very interesting effect of this. In fact, philosophically it says that if everything is interconnected, if your environment is interconnected, then culturally people across the globe can become interconnected. And you can actually become conscious about cultures and diverse cultures across the world. And in one philosophy, it says that ubiquitous computing and pervasive computing can be a road to peace because people would know each other much more closely. Okay? So technology is not an area which is devoid of society or societal demands and requirements. So in that way, pervasive and ubiquitous computing is related to human needs and aspirations. The related areas are pervasive computing, wearable computing, intelligent environments, augmented reality. Obviously you can see that wearable computing when you are instrumenting a person actually you are making computing wearable. The example of a shirt that I had already talked about and if your environment has to be sensitive to your needs, sensitive to the person with whom it is interacting with and sensitive to needs of the people around you, then that environment has to be intelligent. Devices have to be intelligent. Okay? So intelligence in a way obviously means dealing with complex algorithms, complex logic and if your embedded systems really have capability to run complex algorithms, then your intelligent algorithms or AI techniques can be built into these embedded systems making your entire environment intelligent and sensitive to you. Related to this is that of an augmented reality. The point I was telling that if I can make my entire environment instrumented say with a glass of water okay, and uh, and that glass of water effectively has got a sensor and the communication capability and that entire table with being instrumented can be actually projected onto the screen as a shadow of what is happening in this room. Okay? And there can be a third participant who may not be physically present here, but he can be integrated into this environment 
through similar instrumentation at a remote site. And effectively what you are creating, you are creati creating a kind of an augmented reality environment where, where there are three or more participants with respect to an identical environment, although they are not physically co-located. So what you get is augmented reality scenario. There is a reality and you are augmenting additional things to your reality. In fact, this requires not only this kind of intelligent analysis, it also requires tremendous amount of graphical processing power in terms of your displays, in terms of your environment. In fact, you can really real, uh, feel that uh, I am in a meeting room, okay, which is located maybe thousands of miles away, provided I have created a kind of computer based sensitive environment which may be identical at two different places. And in fact, it helps in various ways. If we want to have a kind of collaborative work between people who are situated distances apart, the basic means today we talk about is maybe communication over telephone, communication over emails, or maybe physically traveling from one place to other. But we would like to extend this whole concept into a more tangible interactions. How can be a tangible interaction? Say for example, if I am drawing a graph on a piece of paper, is it that a participant uh, situated miles apart can directly point onto that graph and tell me something? So actually what I am doing, I am I'm working with a kind of an instrumented artifacts through which I can share the ideas. It is just not the computer screen, it is just not the text over email or just the voice by which I am sharing the ideas. It is through the artifacts, the way naturally we shall do, say for example in a meeting, if I am explaining something on a piece of paper, the other participants can look at the paper, make pointers on the paper, write notes on the papers and that way I can have an interaction, a design can emerge through that kind of an interaction. The question is, we can create artifacts okay, through which this kind of an interaction is possible. We can have a collaborative work done through these artifacts, which are nothing but computers embedded into them with communication facilities and with a kind of a graphical support to create the virtual reality of that environment at distinct places. So all these actually can be referred to and be grouped together under the umbrella term of ubiquitous computing. And per pervasive computing formally can be defined as an environment saturated with computing and communication capability, yet so gracefully integrated with users that it becomes a technology that disappears. Okay? And it subsumes distributed computing and mobile computing. And the basic technology enabling all these things is your embedded systems. So enabling technologies, if you today look at, in fact, all of these we had studied as part of this course. Processing, it's becoming cheaper, faster, smaller, more energy efficient. The storage is big and fast, okay, because you, you need to store lots of information because if you want to have an intelligent environment, you not need to know lots of things about the environment. Networking, there are a variety of networking schemes available, local, ad hoc, low power, high bandwidth, low latencies. In fact, ad hoc networking would enable you a person moving in with his device into any environment being networked and connected. Displays, displays are important to create the illusion of a distant world or a different world in your pervasive environment. So the displays can be projection displays, there are flexible materials being used for displays and low power displays. In fact, interestingly there are, uh, there has been work which has developed like paper like displays, okay, like electronic paper where you can have the displays, you can also write on the paper and that, that writing can be transmitted as well as it may disappear. Okay. So it is just not a screen kind of an interface being talked about. And there are a variety of sensors. In fact, sensors are required to understand uh, basically 
the situation to understand yourself in the environment. And if anything has to be done, then there you will need the actuators which are today computer controlled. In fact, all these things form part of our embedded system technology. And since there has been advancement in this embedded system technology, you are taking one step further, making these embedded systems intelligent, making these embedded systems networked and making the whole system of the environment intelligent and sensitive to the needs of human beings. So, the whole idea is that it is not just a desktop or a keyboard based environment in which you are interacting with computer. Okay? Your devices are everywhere and you are interacting with them. So, what we say uh, where we are moving into is beyond desktop a kind of an appliance computing. You have dedicated devices, mobile phones, digital camera, VCR, PDAs and with these you combine multimodal inputs. Today you have got speech interfaces, pen, touch screen and these technologies have matured enough to give reliable results and to be able to be, uh, to be implemented onto processors with energy cost, energy budget much less. So, they can be put into your handheld devices. Say handwriting in fact was almost disappearing because of your menace of keyboards because if you become a keyboard savvy you tend not to write. But handwriting has got its own flavor, okay? handwriting got its naturality. Okay? Now, the whole thing is that if you look at the handwriting or a pen as a device that has come in because of this embedded system technology because pen as a device is nothing but an embedded system, an electronic pen today you get on which you can write just like uh, you write on a paper, the whole data goes into via USB port to some device. In fact, on your PDAs, you have got completely pen based interface. Your handwriting recognition technology has matured enough to recognize your handwriting. So, your interface with PDA is no longer really keyboard based, but handwriting based. Now, handwriting recognition has gone into PDA simply because you have got more powerful processor which can be put into your PDA, which can have these algorithms, complex algorithms for handwriting recognition being implemented over there. At the same time, the speech recognition, the speech recognition algorithms can be over there and you can actually have a speech interface to a PDA. Okay? And the other objective which is coming up in a big way is zero maintenance. The system should be pre-configured and should have rare failures. That means the reliability, the, in the last class we had talked about dependability of the systems, which also include reliability and availability. So, the effective design objective is if we can make systems more available, then they really become zero appliance and uh, zero maintenance. Once it becomes a zero maintenance, then what happens? The whole technology goes to general human being. It is no longer a technology for technology savvy people. Okay, mobile phone is you do not need uh, any specialized uh, degree or anything to operate your mobile phone. Now, what you would like, you like that entire computing environment to become all pervasive and ubiquitous and natural so that you need not be technology savvy to use them and also it has to be reliable. So, let us look at some example scenarios, what we can achieve with these kind of perspective and philosophy. So, this is a story, okay. uh, let us say a character called Sumit is at gate 23 of an airport and would like to email his edited files through wireless connection, but the bandwidth is miserable. In fact, first part of the story is very real today, various airports today have electronic uh, points, uh, uh, basically wireless communication points to which you can connect your PDAs or your laptops and get connected onto the internet. So, these hot spots are very common in various airports and even hotels. So, here we are looking at a scenario which is going beyond that of just using a hot spot for doing wireless communication. So, what it does, I am referring to some kind of a pervasive computing environment called say BAPTO. The pervasive computing environment detects the situation consults airport servers 
and finds gate 15 will have no flight in one and a half hours. What does that mean? That means a wireless link at gate 15 can give, give a better bandwidth, likely to give a better bandwidth. So, it suggests Sumit to go to gate 15 and prioritize his email. Sumit accepts the suggestion and then files are transmitted at gate 15 and the pervasive environment informs Sumit when he needs to get back to the gate. Now, this is just not that of using a hotspot in an airport. You see that when we are talking about a pervasive computing environment, I am talking of a completely networked environment including the intelligent software which can judge which node will have less load, which link will have less load. It can advise a user accordingly. It is also keeping track of the fact that the user has to catch a flight. Okay? So, he should be alerted to go back to his reporting gate to catch the flight. So, what the point I was telling is, it is just not that of putting computing devices, connecting the things together, it is also that of intelligently monitoring and analyzing the environment. So, what you are bringing in, you are bringing in into a networked embedded computing environment, substantial amount of intelligence to guide and help the users. Okay? So, in fact, what we have talked about so far is that of building up this infrastructure. What we are talking or referring to right now is with this infrastructure, how you can deliver services to a human being. Let us take an another scenario. This is a character called Puja has to walk to a meeting from her office to give a presentation, but she is not quite ready yet. She grabs a handheld computer and starts walking to the meeting. She was working so far on a desktop system. So, the pervasive computing environment should realize that now the work is getting transferred onto a handheld. So, the data, the environment should get automatically loaded onto the handheld. Okay? So, transfers a state from desktop to handheld and Puja does final editing with voice. Okay? Because if you have a voice interface through your handheld computers, it becomes much faster. Okay? While traveling, you can actually do editing through voice. Okay? And it infers that uh, environment BAPTO infers, infers Puja's schedule, downloads materials to projection computer, okay? because if you are wirelessly connected everywhere, then from the handheld computer itself, it can be downloaded onto a projection computer. Your projector itself becomes a computer, because it is no longer a standalone projector, which is to be connected to a PC. It itself is a device embedded with computing power, downloads materials to projection computer and warms up projector. Rooms, when she enters the room, meeting room, the room's face detection system recognizes some unfamiliar faces and advises Puja not to show sensitive data. Okay? So, what we have used here, if you see, various kinds of perceptual techniques in the context of embedded systems. Speech recognition, face recognition. And in fact, if you see, these are the technologies which are, it is not that they are not usable and feasible, they are available. It is a question of setting up the environment, setting up the prototypes, using these technologies and taking the thing further. In fact, face detection recognition system is reasonably mature. Speech recognition is also pretty mature today. And if you have this kind of a networked environment with intelligence built into, you can deliver similar services. Okay? So, this is what is your pervasive computing that is taking embedded systems, networked embedded systems one step further with intelligence and context sensitivity. So, what are the key aspects from these examples we can look at? Proactivity. The environment can estimate how long the whole process takes and look ahead on his behalf. Now, this proactivity can come provided you have built in intelligence into that system. Okay? Then combining knowledge from different layers, wireless congestion and boarding time. These are two different kinds of information and this has to be com combined together 
and this information can come from two different sources using two different kinds of processing. And what you create is effectively what we call a smart space. It provides information of wireless bandwidth, flight time and gates, distance between gates. The entire space is actually mapped. Okay? And the moment you have got a smart space, you can do lots of things. This is a smart space providing uh, the user his navigational aid in an airport so that he can send an email. At the same time, this kind of smart space can be as well used to help a blind navigate an airport. Let us look at scenario 2. Moving execution state across diverse platforms. Now, this is a more of a software technology problem, but you need a mechanism to do that. Then automatic adjusting behavior to fit circumstances because your handheld computer now can work with voice inputs because the person is on move. Proactivity and smart space because the meeting room has got a face recognition system and it recognizes the faces and if it finds that the face is unknown or unfamiliar, it can accordingly advise the user. Okay? So, with the face recognition system, this is highly feasible and possible. In fact, uh, you can build systems which can uh, open up doors by looking at a known face. Obviously, there is a failure uh, rate associated with it, but uh, it can open up a door if there is a known face. If it is an unknown face, it can simply alert the user. This, this is a very simple application and these applications can be built anytime, anywhere today. This is one step beyond than what I had talked about. So, what is the basic model? The basic model is the user is immersed in a personal computing space that mediates all interactions with pervasive computing elements in the surroundings. Okay? And this immersive environment, in the environment, whatever computing we are talking about, it is not computing just from computers, it is computing from variety of devices and household items can be. Okay? So, what are the design aspects? System design, that is, will it be a wearable computer? a personal assistant, a PDA like kind of a thing, what sensors, what kind of networking to be provided. Okay? So, these are technology issues which part of in fact embedded domain. Next is context awareness, how to know user state and surrounding and modify behavior. This is part of a kind of intelligent processing which is to be built into the embedded system. Associated with this is how to cooperate and interact with infrastructure with other persons. Now, here we are talking about a protocol, okay, a protocol for communication, but these protocol at a much higher level than that of a standard communication. It is purely at an application and usability level protocol. And next thing which comes, which is obvious and we had looked at how to roam and adapt. Okay? So, how do we move about? Is it a PDA with 802.11b? Is it with Java? Because Java can have a compiled code which can be downloaded and executed on any platform. So, what would be the technology issues related to this? Okay? So, these are all design aspects which are important if we want to create this model of pervasive computing. So, what we have smart object or environment and these provide services. So, as we have referred to the system design, the question comes is, is which embedded system to be used? What will be the features of that embedded system? Because if you am creating a smart environment, let us try to understand, the smart environment is consisting of smart objects. Okay? Smart objects means entities which can compute, which can take decision on its own, which can interact with the user, which can interact with other such smart objects in the environment. So, effectively a smart environment is consisting of smart objects, smart objects are nothing but embedded systems. Okay? So, the question comes up which kind of embedded systems? Will it have an embedded server built into it? What kind of sensors and actuators to be provided with these smart objects? Associated with this is that of naming, registration, discovery. Is it that whenever I put in a smart object in an environment, how can it be referred to? What should be the naming convention? Because I cannot have a static address associated with it. Okay? 
So, how can it be discovered? How can it register itself with the environment manager? Okay. Then physical and virtual mapping. What does physical and virtual mapping means? So, for example, if I am referring to say a glass of water okay, with a sensor and I am physically moving it around, so that physical movement of that glass have to be mapped onto maybe is virtual existence at a remote location. Okay, to be existed at a remote location. In fact, uh, Microsoft developed a very interesting um, uh, um, demonstration of this kind of a scenario. It is for uh, keeping parents in touch with their children. The basic uh, scenario is something like this. The children are staying miles apart and the parents are away, staying alone. Okay. So, the question is, they would like to keep in touch with their son or their daughter and so they created a kind of a, uh, an artifact where it says that if you come back from the office, you drop your keychain, your purse, maybe your coins onto that artifact. Okay? And as you drop that, parents who are located at remote place gets that feeling that uh, that key has been dropped over there, that sound that vibration, a kind of a virtual feel that the sun has come back home. Okay, in fact, they, they created that environment and they demonstrated that environment. So, it is it's a, it's a kind of a uh, physical to virtual mapping. So, physically you have caught an artifact on which you are actually putting this stuff and there is a virtual environment created far apart and it is just not a screen, it is again an artifact which is producing similar sounds, vibrations and things of that sort. So, you actually you can feel that uh, your loved ones, your son or daughter is, has come back home. Okay? So, just see that how emotions and uh, this kind of uh, technology gets mingled together and that is what they say the future of uh, a kind of pervasive computing, a future of, uh, a future of computing being dissolved into your everyday world. Obviously, related to this is more uh, technology issues that of mobility management, energy management and how do you combine different services? What IO modality to be used? Can it be, can the whole system be adaptive and can you really have environment monitoring? So, these are different kinds of issues which are related to that of creating a smart object or a smart environment. The infrastructure support, infrastructure is basically we talk about electricity roads which are today almost invisible. Okay, we really do not realize that there is electricity and there is a road until unless electricity goes off or road is uh, shattered beyond navigation. So, the basic infrastructure is internet infrastructure. And, uh, and these can happen if you extend internet to everyday objects. Okay? And it is not only just the internet, but I am referring to internet in a more generic sense. Okay? It is just not in terms of this protocols, but in a generic sense that where any kind of networking finally gives you visibility across the world. And that is the key infrastructure, that is key communication infrastructure. And other infrastructural issues that the smart object should guarantee some amount of security, privacy, availability, reliability. In fact, uh, these are all these points which I had discussed in the last class in the context of designing dependable embedded systems. Okay? So, a dependable embedded system can only be a smart object in an environment. And it should provide services, location, where am I, context, are we in a meeting? event delivery tell me when something happens. Brokering is it can do things for me that is find something which I am looking for. So, I can delegate my task to a broker. There should be this directory service so that uh, I know what are the smart objects are available, discovery of smart objects and the registry should be maintained. They should have the ability to move around, okay? the mobility and the roaming capability should be there. Now, you can realize that all these things can be provided, there is an amount of intelligence built into it. Okay? And other thing is that 
a kind of a cooperation protocol, cooperation protocol across objects which you really do not know. If brokering is to be provided for, brokering can actually mean that a smart object needs to interact with other objects at different locations looking for some information. So what should be the protocol for such a kind of a thing? And here it is just not, it may not be just the information, it may be actually a requirement for providing a service. Okay? And service with the complete understanding of the semantics of the service. Okay? Service not in a sense of a syntactic features, but understanding the semantics of a service. Now what does that mean? It means that say for example, uh, consider an extreme case, you need a service to be provided to a patient immediately. Now, the brokering interface should have the intelligence to figure out what is the best medical service which can be brought in to play in minimum time given the current circumstances. So that cannot be done if you are looking for a service with a keyword medical service. That can be done only if you have a complete understanding of the semantics of the medical service, what are the constraints related to the medical service and how it can be delivered. Okay? So brokering also needs a kind of a framework for that. So what you say in this case that the guarantee with the smart objects are related for applications built with smart objects and these are primarily for smart objects what you are looking at and uh, another question which is how do we organize billions of mobile smart objects that are highly dynamic and short living. Okay? So it is just not the question of networking or communications. Okay? What you are looking at is you are talking about managing so many smart objects together so that they, they actually give you a unified picture, something as a whole and not individually. So if you look at a set of swarms of flies, now you look at them as a swarm and, and really individual role of a fly is not really important. So you are looking at multiple smart objects. So smart objects as a whole, what they can really deliver? That is a big question. How do smart objects can self-organize themselves? Can they self-organize themselves to deliver a service? Can they self-heal themselves to deliver a service? In fact, in many cases when we discuss with the sensor networks, we talked about these protocols. But here, now the protocols can come in at more from the application perspective rather than from the communication perspective. Okay? And that makes this problem more interesting. Next thing is user intent. A pervasive computing system must track user intent, determine which actions will help and not hinder user. Suppose a user is viewing a video over a network whose bandwidth suddenly drops. Should the system reduce the fidelity of the video? Pause briefly to find another higher bandwidth connection. Advise the user that the task can no longer be accomplished. So what you are getting an intelligent video player. Okay, so video player is sensing what is happening and trying to take decision depending on maybe the user's intent. And if it has to take a decisions on the basis of user's intent, it possibly need to have user's profile. You need to track how the user has behaved in the past, build up its profile and then it is delivering service. So what you are getting is a kind of a personalized service from the variety of devices. So correct choice depends on what user is trying to accomplish. So user intent, if you see today's applications either have no idea about user's intent, example to support adaptation and proactivity or do it badly. So the issues are, can user intent be inferred or does it have to be explicitly provided? How is user intent represented internally and what are represented? How does one characterize accuracy of knowledge? Is incomplete or imprecise information useful? Will obtaining intent place and burden on the user? All these are usability issues. In fact, in fact, with embedded systems, usability is a big issue. I can design an embedded system with lots of features, but if I have not taken care of how the user will interact with the system, then the system is bound to fail. Okay? It's, it's, it's not just making a design which will go into a box. It's that of engineering a design so that user would be attracted to use it. And that's a fundamental point. And if you now bring in user's intent into it, 
if you now bring in the capability to assess user's intent and make the system behave according to user's intent, so what you get? You get a personalized device, which is a kind of a dream for everybody. I would like to know uh, that on my mobile phone, the calls that are coming, whether they are important or not. And then only the call should be admitted, otherwise it may be rejected. Okay? In fact, uh, I, I can put the mobile phone off, but in many cases, I may not like to put the mobile phone off. I shall only would like to accept those calls which are critical when I am busy. So, can I have a personalized mobile phone? That is a basic question. And today, if you have more processing power and if you can build in these capabilities, this, is, this can be a reality. So, next question is adaptation strategy. Necessary when there is significant mismatch between the supply and demand of a resource, which is, which is true everywhere today. Okay, bandwidth, energy, computing cycles. There can be various strategies for adaptation. The client guides applications in changing their behavior. The client asks the environment to guarantee a certain level of resource. The client suggests a corrective action to the user. So this is just not a QS negotiation. This is more from the perspective of the application and the user's need, a intelligent management of resource. So it says, how does a client choose between adaptation strategies? How strategies can be changed seamlessly as the user moves? Okay? Because as the user moves, the bandwidth can also, available bandwidth can dynamically change. How, do, how to do resource reservation in a smart space? What are appropriate admission control policies? What API are needed to make these reservations? Will corrective actions be intrusive? How to do it? What could be API or the programming model? What is the relationship between lowering fidelity and adaptation? These are just questions. Okay? These are the issues which needs to be addressed. Okay? Now, the question is what kind of programming models be used so that you can actually model an adaptive corrective behavior? Okay? So, the behavior is not completely pre-programmed. Please try to understand this. The difference where it is coming up, we are talking of an adaptation process that the program or the software or the system as a whole adapts to the scenario and accordingly takes autonomous decisions. Okay? And if it is taking autonomous decisions, the question is how do you build in that autonomy into the system? Let us look at high energy management. We have talked about and discussed about energy management because energy management was a key problem in embedded systems because majority of the devices are battery powered. And we had talked about so far low level techniques, battery, circuit design, then intelligent scheduling. Okay, we have looked at intelligent scheduling also. But can it be done from a high level perspective, from an application level perspective? Issues are what high level systems can be managed for energy efficiency, memory, application, adaptation, all these things. Are they intrusive to the user? Can user intent help? Okay. If user currently is not really interested in watching, a, uh, watching the TV, then what can happen? I can simply shut off the TV and keep the link open for any incoming messages. Okay. By that process, I can actually save energy. So, this energy saving strategy is more from the user's intent, intent and the perspective. Okay? And if I can really judge or assess user's mood by, by maybe uh, recognizing his facial expressions, then, then it becomes a system of a different kind altogether. Okay? So, then energy management is depends upon the user's mood and taking actions. Okay? Now, this is where the technology is being dreamt of. This is where the technology is intent to go. Okay? And that is where the interest and excitement is all about. Okay? And uh, the question is how to trade off energy used in remote execution with wireless connection. Okay? So, remote execution when you are doing over and wireless connection, then you need not use the complete energy over there. Now, we are using clients and at every level, there will be clients which, is, which are being used. How powerful does a mobile client need to be? From bare bone devices to high resolution displays through wireless to servers, there can be a variety of these kind of client capabilities depending on the room because the environment in the room can be really a client as well. So, the question is how to migrate application become clients of different capability, how to cooperate with infrastructure 
Can clients be reconfigurable to adapt to environment? Semi-portable infrastructure for less hospitable environment because environment need not be similar under all kind of circumstances. Okay. How to roam transparently, especially from a benign environment to a poor one? Okay. How to lower the cost of diversity in devices? It should not be that uh, in this room I need to use one device. When I go out in the external environment, I need to need use another device. The diversity has to be minimized. So this leads us what is, uh, this is all related to what is called context aware computing. Computing services sense aspects of environment, location, user emotion and tailor the provided services. So the example is walk into conference room, my email is projected on a big screen there. Okay? So everybody can see the email because I might have sent that email to the people participating in that meeting. So context awareness is needed for an environment minimally, minimally intrusive. It should recognize user state and surroundings, make decisions proactively and modify behavior accordingly. Issues, obtaining information needed to function, how to represent context internally, how often to update and consult context information, what service does the infrastructure have to provide, how to track locations and sense surroundings. You have seen very simple context sensitivity when you move around with your mobile phone and you say, you see that message that with the place where you are, that location awareness. Okay? And that's one aspect of your, this context awareness of the system. Context awareness obviously means you need to have lots of information. Okay? The storage also becomes an important issue. And what is the rate at which it is to be updated? Because that update will make the system correctly context sensitive. So let's look at an example. In fact, this is an example device which was built long back called Active Badge. Okay? It's nothing but again an embedded system. Contains a microprocessor and an infrared transmitter. Okay? And if you talk about your RFIDs, this is basically something like your active RFID. The badge broadcasts identity of its owner. Okay? So you can have the owner information, you carry that badge and it can open automatic door it can permit you to log into a system. Okay? So it makes you, makes the environment sensitive to you. Okay? In that sense, it's a context awareness. Now there are also intelligent spaces, system for recognizing user moods for, from their facial expressions. So in a room, you can be recognized and accordingly, one, once you walk into a room, the music, channel music can actually change to suit your mood. Next thing is house where position is sensed and temperature adjusted automatically. In fact, your sensor networks can provide the basic uh, framework to provide this kind of a feature, intelligent home. And in, intelligent buildings are pretty common today. Okay? Then proactivity, how not to annoy a user in a proactive system. Okay? So self-tuning according to user's expertise and experience. This become a social computing issue. Okay? People should not be disturbed beyond a certain level and they get annoyed such that uh, they might not like to use the pervasive computing system. It should not be like that every time I write I, I becomes capital and I have to come back and correct that. So next question is privacy and trust. So if I have to use them that I should, I should be sure about privacy of my environment. Privacy should not be bugged into. That details of that should not be transmitted to an unauthorized user. Okay? And it should need a mutual trust between environment and user. And you are seeing various kinds of cyber crimes are coming in, which are actually breach of these privacy con uh, considerations. And these cyber crimes are emerging again because of your embedded systems and things being able to put in at variety of places. And when you are talking about pervasive computing, we are exactly referring to that kind of a scenario with the additional condition that privacy and trust, that's a key component. Otherwise, you really cannot have this kind of a pervasive setting. And the layering, the layering is relationship because pervasive computing has to take information across multiple layers. So let's take an example. This is a live board example, a pervasive computing system. So this is a board where the pictures can be projected, I, uh, the teacher can explain, can write, and the entire thing at the same time goes into the screen in, in front of the participants, which may be located anywhere. And these participants can also interact with the screen on their own, and that gets reflected over here. Okay? So 
uh, it is in this kind of a classroom setting every one of you will have this desk and you can actually point out to a point over here and ask me a question. Okay. So, this is an example of an pervasive computing system with a life board where actually this itself is a device an embedded system each one of the terminals are also embedded systems and they are all connected via communication link. The other interesting example is a pin and play network. Okay. So, wall as a network of things attached to it familiar tangible interaction pinning because if you have a board you would like to pin things over there and preserve original functionality. Okay. So, this is the board where you pin various things as you pin this each one of them gets actually connected to the network fine. So, you can actually know that this is a piece of paper that is available there. So, what the architecture says surface with a conductive layer push pin like physical connector socketless attachment of objects it can be arbitrary type, type of objects in fact sockets can be provided with that information sockets can even sense those information and discovery of objects when they become attached. Okay. So, example is pin and play light switch place it where you like in fact that is that is already available you can put in anywhere and have the light switch. So, it is it is you have what you have got the switching over a network okay. you are you are putting light switches over a network and can be connected anywhere. Ubiquitous service is uh, one to receive a message using whatever device is handy nearby okay. and message is tailored to work according to the device it is just not that you have to have the messaging program running on your system or on your mobile it can be on anything it should sense which device is currently accessible that is the kind of ubiquitous services and the obviously here the issues are infrastructure and how the standards have to be uh, adaptive and uh, we cannot adopt one standard. So, there has to be flexibility with regard to that. The other thing which has emerged is interfaces pain input speech input gesture as well as tangible other interfaces like I have talked about interface like a pinning things in. Okay. So, this is possible simply because you can provide this kind of an uh, ability through your computing. So, if you are interacting with the environment it has to be multi mobile it, it, it has to be multi modality as well as the mobile. And here again because of the capability as the point I had already talked about errors are more likely and you can correct them discover them your software can become more powerful because you have a more powerful processor. Next comes the wearable computing you can wear them your, your basically spec itself can have a computerized display which gives you a much better display maybe a 3D display of a remote site or a or a kind of a much better display of the world. You can have a wristband which senses your heart rhythm okay, and takes care of your uh, heart conditions a shot the example which I had already given. So, wearable computing is another very interesting aspect of your pervasive computing and they are also what we are putting in nothing but embedded systems. So, we come to the conclusion of this lecture as well as that of the course. What we find that embedded systems has led to if we see ubiquitous computing that ubiquitous computing encompasses system infrastructure, networking, security, user interfaces, embedded systems, AI, perception, speech recognition and everything put together. And the key the base behind them has been the advancements in the embedded systems and here the system integration is a key and what this is leading to leading to many new interesting and fascinating research problems. So, in future with the basic uh, background of this course if you go into designing embedded systems and explore these research problems that would be very interesting. Thank you.